Working together to make a better community. Welcome to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guests today are Dodi Legasic and Charles Faust, both from Environment North. Welcome, Dodi and Charles. Uh, we're here today to talk a little bit about one of the activities with Environment North around the uh, storing of uh, spent nuclear waste in northwestern Ontario. But before we do that, um, uh, uh, Dodi, let's start with you. Give us a little bit of background uh, on your own history. Are, are you uh, born and bred in Thunder Bay or, or how did you get here? Well, I was a, a military uh, kid, so I traveled quite a bit. Um, and so it was not in any one particular place. I came up here, though, in 1977 uh, and became um, a secondary high school teacher. And that's what I did for, you know, until I retired. So I've been, um, I raised my children here. I consider myself a stakeholder, a long-term resident now for at least four decades. And I'm well, an environmentalist, um, I always have been. Great. Well, so glad you're, you're able to join us today. And, and Charles, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. I was uh, born in Terrace Bay on the North Shore of Lake Superior. Uh, so I, I uh, am quite familiar with, you know, the, uh, the <laughs> evolution of the uh, of things uh, along that stretch of water. Uh, pretty much full time resident of uh, Northwestern Ontario, except those times when I ventured out into the world. And but I always came back here and uh, I feel uh, you know, a very strong attachment to the land. Well, great. It's so great to have you both. Now, tell us a little bit about Environment North. Uh, what, I think they've been around for quite a few years. Um, uh, what, uh, tell us a little bit about Environment North. Well, I can... Charles. I'm sorry. Okay, I was going to defer to Dodi on that one. She's been a, a, a member longer than I have. Uh, so why don't you go ahead, Dodi? Yes, well, I've, I've only been a member for the past four going on five years, uh, but it has been in existence since the uh, later 70s. And um, Environment North is made up of a group of people who look at issues um, to do with the environment, and, um, and they speak on behalf of, the, of people who have concerns about, about environmental issues. And so I'm the nuclear lead for Environment North now. And um, so we're, we're speaking in opposition to NWMO's um, plan to put high level waste into a deep geological repository. And NWO, did I get those letters right? What does that stand for? NWMO refers to the Nuclear Waste Management Organization. Okay. All right, and we've been hearing about them a little bit because they've been going into a number of communities in the north, uh, talking to people about storing nuclear waste in their communities. Uh, so, so Charles, can you give us a little bit of background on on what they're doing and and um, and, and how they're interacting in our communities? Oh, well, in a nutshell, uh, you know, since around uh, I think uh, 2010, the uh, this would be the latest. Uh, version of uh, the attempt to solve the problem with nuclear waste. The NWMO was formed uh, from uh, and of the uh, nuclear power producers in Canada. So Ontario Power Generation, Hydro Quebec, New Brunswick Power. Uh, those are the those are the producers. They got together, and so this is a um, this is a you know. A, an organization is not uh, it's, it's not a, a you know a, a, a community organization. It's a it's a it's an organization of the uh, business of producing power uh, to to and their mandate is to solve the uh, problem of nuclear waste. So um, since around 2010, they've been site they started the siting process, um, which involves finding a willing host community to accept 
the waste. Um, Ignace and South Bruce are the two remaining of, um, of over a dozen uh, communities that they looked into and considered for a while. So at the present time, uh, there is a, a proposal and, uh, so, and work is being done drilling uh, scientific, you know, geological studies in, uh, in an area uh, near Revel Lake, just west of Ignace that's looking at, at uh, developing a deep geological repository. In other words, um, an underground cavern where they would store uh, spent fuel rods, the high level stuff, um, of which, you know, there's, you know, um, you know, all of the waste that's been produced from nuclear reactors in, in over 40 years is, is sitting in different, places in those provinces that are producing power, Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick. Um, and they're hoping to find a place to bury all of that. Is that fair, Dodie? It, it is. Um, the, uh, one thing I'll note, though, is that um, there is low level, high level, and there's medium intermediate level. And so um, what we're looking at here from all of the CANDU reactors, all of Canada, are um, is the high level waste and the high level waste comes from, are the nuclear spent nuclear fuel bundles that come from the core of the reactor so it's the most dangerous the most radioactive waste of all of the uh, of all of the waste material so i have a memory that this uh search uh to figure out what to do with these uh radioactive uh, fuel rods has been going on for a long time uh, not only in Canada but really around the world I think some 40 years ago they were talking about uh, uh, putting it in Atacokan and then the community there seemed to uh, resist it as, as in a way we've heard all across Ontario that uh, communities are not that welcoming uh, What's happening in, in Ignis these days? Like it, they're they're the finalists. It sounds like uh, along with the Bruce area. Um, what's happening in, in Ignis around that? I could comment on that. Um, in Ignis, uh, there there's about twelve hundred people there. Um, they were approached, or twenty two communities were approached by NWMO. And um, if they were interested, then they in, in letting NWMO in to do some research and investigation, they were given hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars um, by uh, for expressing that interest. And um, many of these uh, communities were economically depressed communities. So to have the um, you know um, input of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars was quite welcoming. And um, and then they also just wanted to see. Out or learn more about the about the project. That's been the case with Ignis since 2010. And they have received uh, funding in that area for three million dollars, and there's an additional four million dollars coming up. Um, and so um, it's it's um, it's it's a good it's a win-win for uh, Ignis in that respect because uh, the monies that go in there um, help to fund all kinds of different things within their community. So you can see why it's attractive to them to have NWMO up there. But it does raise the question, the ethical question um, about consent. But consent is going to be required in the year 2023 by not just IGNES, but by also the local indigenous community of Wabagoon, which is further west from the Rival Lake site. And so, um, so Ignace right now, um, their council is um, very pro um, having the deep geological repository in the Revel Lake site. Now remember that site isn't in Ignace, it's 42 kilometers west of Ignace. So, so there are a lot of people all around the area that have not yet been considered by NWMO as, um, as, as uh, people that will be part of that vote. It's just being relegated so far to Ignace and to Wabagoon. So if, if less, if about 600 people vote for it in Ignace, then um, then you're, we're going to see uh, NWMO moving in. 
So, so um, just before we get to kind of the, all that transportation issues around that, the uh, if I recall, so this nuclear waste is stuff that would be radioactive for what a thousand years, ten thousand years. What 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 are we talking about here? This is like this is stuff that's not going to go away, right? Okay. Uh, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years as well. Um, so, uh, you know, and it, it, this this has to, this DGR has to last a minimum of 400,000 years. Oh, my yeah. gosh. So, so we're talking about um, a whole bunch of highly radioactive material traveling, um, was it by road across our region, uh, potentially then to end up west of Ignis? Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you see with that whole transportation of the nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. Almost all environmental groups are really concerned about the transportation issue. NWMO does not want to address the um, some of the transportation Issues until the central site is selected, whether it's going to be Ignis or Teeswater in South Bruce. Um, but transportation is a huge issue if it ends up in being in Ignis, because this is coming, like uh, Carl said, it's coming from as far east as uh, New Brunswick, and then there's uh, from Point La Pro, and then Gentilly in Quebec, White Shell in Manitoba, and then uh, that makes up 10%. And the other 90%, the bulk of it, is coming from southern Ontario from Chalk River and Pickering and Darlington, um, from Bruce and from Douglas. And Bruce, you should realize, is the biggest um, nuclear um, reactor site in the world. And so 90% will be transported. Um, well, all of it, 100% will be transported those long, long distances. So you're looking at 2,700 kilometers, at least from New Brunswick. Um, you're looking at 1,650 or so from Southern Ontario. So you're looking at, from Southern Ontario, uh, at least 18 hours straight driving with these uh, 192 bundles in a UFTP, which is a used fuel transportation package on um, a transport truck. And so that raised for me a huge flag um, and interest in looking into MTO's data about collisions and looking at the collision rate from Pickering to uh, Ignis. Now I can, I can tell you something oh, about that if you would like. Oops. I'm, I'm sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, so, so sorry about that. I, we've heard so much about uh, accidents uh, on our highways uh, with uh, tractor trailers. Uh, what did you find out in your data there? So I've been looking at MTO data since 2010. And in, um, in, in the, um, so what I've been looking at, what I've asked MTO data for is um, a listing of all of the collisions and a listing of all of all the truck collisions and um, from Pickering to Ignace as a case study. And um, over the years, I've noticed uh, that the worst part of the uh, transportation in uh, in that entire route is um, starts really in the northern part of Ontario. Um, it, it is horrendous. Uh, don't get me wrong. It's horrendous in the Pickering to uh, to Highway 400. Um, the number of accidents there is crazy. Okay, but as to give you an example, in the last five years, 2015 to 2020. Um, from Pickering to Ignace, there were 47,454 total collisions. I know, and out of that, um, and out of that were 7,010 transport truck. That's that, you know, so, so the chances of, um, of having a transport truck uh, accident um, has been increasing over the years. In fact, um, for the viewing audience, what I've done is I've looked at um, the Thunder Bay area. And so 
from um, just outside of Thunder Bay from Shabaqua, where Highway 11 and 17, they, where they split, um, you would take Highway 17 to go to Ignace. And so um, that is in Northwestern Ontario, probably the worst stretch of, um, of highway. It's 182 kilometers. And, uh, and over the last five years, the first five years, 2010 to 2015, the percentage of truck collisions versus all collisions was 41%. Now in the last five years, that's jumped by another 10%. And in, 19, in 2019, there were um, 149 uh, truck collisions, or sorry, 149 collisions on that stretch in that one year. And out of that, 94 of those were truck, transport trucks. That's that's sixty three about sixty three percent. So so this is the stretch, the last stretch for these truckers to be coming through from southern Ontario. So it's a difficult stretch, especially when you get into that Upsala area in the in the winter time. So um, collisions, transport truck collisions, is a huge issue. Um, if the high level waste was maintained, stored at the reactor sites where it is now. And if they put the $23 billion that they're putting into abandoning it in a deep geological report, or if they put that money into improving the storage facilities and the CAS and the and and, and making it more secure, a uh, safer place um, in by all of the reactor sites where it hasn't been stored and has been for up to 50 years, then I think that's the solution. We shouldn't be transporting it. So we are. We already know, you know, from other countries that the effects of exposure uh, from these nuclear reactors can be really significant. You know, the the big uh, Fukushima, um, where Mother Nature rolled in and uh, and then exposed. You know lots of people that area still uh, is uninhabitable so we're talking about both something stored uh, west of ignis and then also the transportation piece so if if one of those trucks went off the road how would that affect our area uh, charles you've done some work in terms of uh, of mapping in watersheds what are we looking at there uh, uh... So there, there are two things. You know, I got brought in. I really, I was looking at the tertiary watersheds in the in the area under consideration. Uh, so that's that's one thing. The, the second is like the Lake Superior uh, watershed. So I, I'd like to, to mention both of those. The uh, you know in the first one, um, NWMO uh, in their reports have said that. Uh, you know, that the Wabagoon River, the Wabagoon River uh, and the areas downstream are the sort of area that they need, the only area they need to look at. But on, when we looked at it, the, uh, it, you know, it turns out their, um, their mining withdrawal, in other words, the area that they're, that they're uh, looking at permitting, uh, it actually bridges two watersheds, two serious major watersheds both the Wabagoon and the Turtle River, which um, which flows into the Rainy River, into Lake of the Woods, um, and, and then following that into the Winnipeg River and it ends up in, uh, in the Nelson River in northern Manitoba. Um, so the Wabagoon joins the, uh, the English uh, River system and um, and they meet up at uh, Grassy Narrows and join the, Win the Winnipeg River and that's where they come together. So really, um, you know, the, you know, there is there is the deep geological that's been discussed. There's also um, an option for shallow burial mm -hmm. um, uh, on site, which um, which is actually, I mean, um, so it, it's even more worrisome in a way than the deep because uh, once permitted, um, we expect fully, and the license, you know, the license would allow NWMO to start moving this uh, material and to store it on site above ground uh, and uh, pending repackaging for burial and abandonment. Um, so, so this, I mean, this 
you know, it's a long-term project. It could be sitting above ground for a long time uh, while they get the rest of it uh, going. So, um, so the opportunity for it to get into the waterways uh, is is real, and and uh, so and we're looking at sort of the, you know, the, both ways, uh, both watersheds in this case. Uh, in terms of the transportation issue, and I know uh, like our viewers in Thunder Bay are, are, are maybe asking, well, like you know, that's Ignace. What about us? You know, the um, the Lake Superior watershed is interesting in in the sense that it's not very large. Uh, it's composed of uh, a lot of high slopes and rocky, typically very rocky um, terrain, which means that um, the runoff is quick. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and anything that, uh, that, that say, and say if there was an accident, um, um, you know, it, it would get very quickly get into Lake Superior. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then like, you know, you don't get it back. Like it's, it's there um, for good. So, so that's, um, you know, you know that, that anyone who's driven the North Shore, or you know Highway 11, um, it's uh, it's it's pretty um, you know it's pretty pretty critical in terms of uh, accidents. So so we're really talking about um, a, a wide geographical area that could be exposed to these kind of long-term hazards. Um, who's involved? Like. Like no one's come and asked me if what I think about having nuclear waste in the area. Is, is there some way that that people can share their opinions or or get involved to find out more and also to have their say? Yes, um, I could address that. Um, you people, the viewers need to know that we're looking at two transport truckloads a day. As every day for a period of 40 years. So that's 620 shipments per year. Now, years and years ago, it, you know, we were there were just five shipments in the entire year. Now we're looking at two per day for 40 years. And so um, I need to get back to your your question there. But what can be done? Is um, you know in, in the past in 19 in sorry yeah 1988 there was a plebiscite that pointed uh, that the city held and we we called ourselves a nuclear weapons free zone um, and what we need to do um, is we need to have a referendum or a plebiscite coming up in this next municipal election probably um, so that everyone in um, northwestern Ontario in all their municipalities will have the opportunity to uh, to vote for or against it because every community along the transportation route has a, is potentially affected. It's interesting to note that your house insurance policies will not cover any uh, nuclear waste spills. So if there's one on the highway and you're living by that highway, then you're not going to be covered unless you go through the Nuclear Liability Act and that will take many, many years. To get any compensation for any damages done. Cesium and strontium are the two things that will get into, if the truck goes into a water body, and we have 72,000 square kilometers of water in north, the Northwest region alone, we have 73,000 kilometers of rivers, and then we have Lake Superior at 82,000 square kilometers. And if it, at any one point cesium gets into that water, or strontium, cesium will go into muscle of any animal, including us, um, through through water and the, the products uh, that um, are produced from the water. And strontium is the same thing. You know, it attacks the bones. And uh, both of those have uh, half lives, they say, of 30 years, but the actual lifespan in the water will be uh, hundreds of years because we're talking half lives. So I'm just, um, you know, wondering how uh, how much to trust, I guess, the folks that are, are you know, promoting this. I, I mean, I look at our industry in Northwestern Ontario, 
um, oftentimes when uh, the money stops flowing, uh, the industry disappears and the communities are left to pick up the pieces. Uh, here we're talking about a project uh, with a, it sounds like at least a 40 year time span just to transport the stuff. Uh, and if whatever, the money runs out for the nuclear industry or we get left with piles of it sitting on the ground there at Revel Lake or what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's very disturbing that, um, you know, the, the way that the industry is going about this, um, it, we as a society are much too quick to bury our problems. And that's exactly what they're looking at out of sight, out of mind, and the real um, motivation behind them is so that they can continue to produce this waste material at, e at an even faster rate as they uh, start talking about uh, you know, other forms of nuclear power coming uh, that they would like to, uh, to come online. So taking advantage of a small community um, is uh, and by you know through handouts is uh, is not a, a very honorable way to uh, to look at a, a something that that as Dodi said involves all of us. So we're we're just uh, coming to close to, to the end of our time together. Uh, if people want to find out more information, uh, how can they do that? Uh, is, is there a way to contact Environment North or you guys? Uh, how can people find out more and, and get involved? Um, it's uh, simple to Google um, environmentnorth.ca um, and go to the home page, go to the nuclear waste section, and then there is there's all kinds of material available for you there. Uh, there is a, a two-part documentary that was filmed by APTN that it will give you an overview of the entire uh, project and um, the responses by people in um, the Indigenous people near uh, Ignis. It's very good. Um, there's also reference to, I would highly recommend uh, looking at the references to Gordon Edwards, how I became a nuclear skeptic, or going to the Canadian to see his site just go Google um, Gordon Edwards uh, CCNR. Um, also on April the 22nd, uh, Environment North has their AGM and uh, that's on Earth Day, so it's easy to remember. And we uh, we have as our guest speaker, Gordon Edwards, and he's going to be speaking about abandonment versus the stewardship of, um, of the waste. Well, Dodi and Charles, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I encourage our audience to find out more and uh, and then have your say in, in, in what you think about burying nuclear waste in our area. Uh, I also want to uh, remind our viewers that they can find out um, uh, more on our Facebook page, Community Conversations. We post a link to all our old shows there. We're always looking for your ideas and suggestions on future shows. Uh, with that, I want to say please stay safe and look forward to seeing you again soon. Th thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Working together to make a better community.